Welcome everyone back to this um, Grand Challenge lecture, lecture series. I'm Professor Kerry Wilson and your MC for this afternoon. It's great to be back with what promises to be a fascinating and thought provoking presentation from journalist and press freedom, freedom advocate, Professor Peter Greste. So it's my pleasure now to hand you over to Professor Susan Carson, uh, the head of QUT School of Communication, and she will introduce our speaker for today. So over to you, Susan. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, so for today's Grand Lecture, we're very pleased to be joined by Professor Peter Grester. An internationally recognised journalist, Peter spent two decades as a foreign correspondent for international news organisations, including the BBC, Reuters, CNN and Al Jazeera. So today, Peter's very well known, but I should point out that from his early days at QUT, Peter was thought to be exceptional. A fellow student from that period told me that while he was editing extraordinary packages with multiple international sources, she was still doing reports on knee injuries in indoor cricket. So he's moved from there, from that QUT base, to reporting from the front lines in locations such as the Balkans, Africa, Afghanistan, Central and South America, and the Middle East. Along the way, he covered some of the biggest uh, events of recent times, including the emergence of the Taliban in Afghanistan in the 90s and later their retreat from Kabul at the beginning of the post-11 war in 2001. Speaking to the digital journalist about his experiences reporting in Afghanistan in 2001, Peter said, it's also the only game that matters now. And as a journalist, it's hard not to be the center of the story. These words were proved to be prescient in ways he probably could not have imagined at the time. In 2013, Peter became the story when he and his two Al Jazeera colleagues were arrested, convicted of national security charges and jailed in Egypt. The imprisonment of Peter and his colleagues sparked international condemnation and a global campaign for their release. Peter eventually achieved his freedom in 2015 after more than 400 days in detention while his two colleagues were released some months later. Peter's ordeal in Egypt has fueled the next stage of his professional life as a fierce and tireless campaigner for press freedom. His passionate advocacy has earned him several international awards, including the Australian Human Rights Commission Medal, the RSL's 2016 Anzac Peace Prize, and the Australian Press Council's 2018 Press Freedom Press Award. We're very proud of the fact that Peter is a QUT alumnus, graduating with a Bachelor of Business Communications and with a Journalism major. And for his achievements, he was recognised by the university with an Outstanding Alumni Award in 2017. Peter is also giving back to the next generation of journalists in his role as a UNESCO Chair of Journalism and Communication at the University of Queensland. As you will hear today, defending freedom of expression and freedom of journalists to report the facts without persecution is very much still an imperative. In this age of post-truth and alternative facts, it's an issue which goes to the very heart of our democratic system and one that compels our attention and support. I note that our new intake of students into the journalism study area at QUT is growing, and I have no doubt that leaders such as Peter provide the inspiration for the journalists of tomorrow. Please join with me in welcoming Peter Brister. Thank you very much, Susan. It's a great honour to be talking to you today and, and uh, thank you also for that very generous introduction. Um, I know that, um, although I suppose some of what I've been doing in recent years um, might, might, uh, might have, have surprised some of my colleagues, I think my mother would have, <laughs> would have preferred it if I'd taken a different path. Um, so let me share my screen and just introduce you to the topic of today, the, today's discussion. It's the assault on journalism and why it matters. And what I wanted to do today was to talk you through some of the history, um, talk you through how we got to where we are at the moment, um, how I came to understand what has really been going on here, and then talk to you a little bit about the state of affairs, firstly around the world, and then here in Australia, and finish up with a bit of a discussion about how we can tackle it. Um, for me, we, we need to go back to when the statistics started to be gathered. And this is, let me take you first to um, a map of press freedom from 1995. This is 
and that book was produced by Freedom House. Um, and what you can see here is the green areas which show those areas of the world that, are, that uh, Freedom House considers to be completely free. The yellow areas are those that are partly free. The purple areas are the areas of the world that are not free. And there are a few, a couple of hatched areas. Um, in this particular case, it was Afghanistan and Algeria that were considered to be the worst of the worst. And that's the way things were in 1995. If we jump forward to 2000, five years, because the, that's the way they've, they've compiled these maps every five years, we see that the situation has considerably darkened. That purple area um, has spread right through into the uh, former Soviet republics. Um, we've seen the formerly green areas of Latin America turn yellow, and a lot of yellow areas also spread into Africa. We jump forward another five years to 2005, we see a little bit of a fight back in Africa, though some of those yellow areas have turned green, but there is still um, an, inc an increasing encroachment of the purple areas. 2010, a little bit better in Africa, but Latin America again has gone, uh, has gone almost entirely yellow with the exception of Chile and back in those days, Venezuela and um, Paraguay. 2015, we see things, particularly purple areas, have, have extended right across um, uh, Central Asia, Asia, down into Southeast Asia, across the Middle East, and deeper into Africa. And we even see some troubling areas of yellow uh, spreading into Europe. Overall, and we have to, we do have some figures from 20, from 2020. Please forgive me. The um, I don't know why they did it, but unfortunately they didn't uh, keep the color scheme the same. This is the way Freedom House sees it in 2020. Now, again, you'll note that uh, things have improved a little bit in Latin America, but those purple areas remain stubbornly high. Overall, Freedom House considers the world to be in the worst state since 2020. Sorry, since the turn of the century, since 2000. Freedom, uh, press freedom in particular, is in a troubling state of decline. So what's going on? How did, where did this all come from? Well, for me, um, I really started thinking about this back in, in 2015, 2014, when we, when my two colleagues, Mohammed Fami and Baha Mohammed, were in prison in Egypt on terrorism charges. And for a long time, I assumed that it was about what, what we had done. It was about a conflict or confusion over the work that we as individuals have done. But the more I looked at it, the more I realized that in fact, this was that the Egyptian government had used loosely framed national security legislation, which on paper looked pretty solid, it looked like um, the kind, of, the kind of, of legislation that you would expect a responsible government to enact. But that also defined words like terrorism and national security incredibly broadly. So broadly, in fact, that any narrative that questioned or challenged the integrity of the state um, was seen as an act of terror. And so by speaking to the opposition at the time, the Muslim Brotherhood, we became guilty of advocating terrorist ideology because, of course, the government had accused the Brotherhood, excuse me, of, of being involved in, in terrorism. We felt because the Brotherhood was the most active political force and, and probably indisputably and, and the uh, most potent political force in the country at the time, uh, we had a responsibility to speak to them to find out what their views of the unfolding situation really were. And so the more I looked at it, the more I realized that in fact, what had happened to us in Egypt, the way in which a government had used loosely framed national security legislation to then target uncomfortable journalism was something that we'd seen around the world the question is, when did all of this change? And, and I think we've got a few statistics here uh, from the Committee to Protect Journalists that also help us understand things. So this is a graph of the numbers of journalists killed. And you'll see, the over I, want to pay, I want you to pay attention to the overall shape of the graph. You'll see that from, um, from the early, early 1990s, when they started uh, collating the figures, the numbers were reasonably high, and that's largely down to a number of particularly nasty civil conflicts in um, the former Yugoslavia, in Somalia, Rwanda, and Algeria. In a lot of those cases, the journalists were bystanders who or were, were um, caught up in those conflicts because 
they're involved in the ethnic conflicts. They're seen as either one side or the other of the ethnic divide, and therefore they're caught up in those ethnic conflicts, more because of their ethnicity than because of their journalism. Then through the mid, uh, mid to late 90s, we have what now seems like a bit of a golden era for journalism. Um, and then through the early 2000, from 2003, 2004, they started to climb until the numbers reached around 70 or 80 per year um, through the, 2000, the, the, early, the late noughties and the early teens. The numbers have tailed off in recent years, and I'll talk about those in a moment. But what I want you to notice is this point here around the early 2000s, when we really saw the, the, the war on terror take off, when the invasion in Iraq take off. And to me, that moment, that period is really crucial because that was when we saw the war on terror begin. Now, I was a correspondent. I'd been working in Afghanistan in the early 90s, and I was able to work and cross the front lines quite a lot to talk to the Taliban, who are on the opposition, as well as the pro-government forces, because we were seen as observers rather, as, rather than as participants in that conflict. But when 9-11 happened, what we saw was a change in the nature of war from conflicts over tangible things that you could put your finger on, those conflicts in which journalists were observers, to a war over ideas. And in that war of ideas, journalists are no longer simply observers. We become participants because in a war of ideas, the place where ideas are transmitted by definition becomes a part of the battlefield. This is not an abstract idea. George W. Bush declared that in this war on terror, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. And so in that binary conflict, journalists became participants, whether we, whether we liked it or not, whether we wanted it or not. And we became targets of both the government, of both governments and of the belligerents on both sides. Now the numbers have tailed off, as I mentioned, um, particularly recently, we, it, it's possible that they are statistical blips, but it seems to me that particularly in recent years after a number of high profile journalist murders, including people like Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi journalist who was murdered in Turkey a few years ago, and um, Daphne um, Caruana Kalitsia, um, the crusading Maltese journalist who was killed in a car bomb attack. And we've seen a really potent debate around press freedom and the need to uh, protect journalists' lives. But that doesn't mean that we can relax. Um, if we have a look at this graph of journalists in prison, again, I'd like to draw your attention to the overall shape. Again, what we see is a surge through the early 90s that dipped down through the mid uh, to late 90s, again, through the early 2000s, we see numbers rise until around the current numbers, around 250 journalists around the world who are in prison for their work. Now, I'm the first to acknowledge that journalists are no angels. Uh, I know that um, they can be guilty of all sorts of crimes and a lot of journalists, frankly, deserve to be in prison. But there's another statistic that I think helps us understand what's really going on here. This is another statistic from the CPJ. This is the one, this is, um, this looks at the, the charges that the journalists are facing. And from 2017, the last time that they did these numbers, although I've had a look at, I've spoken to the CPJ recently, and it seems as though the, the, the numbers are, are still consistent, that around of the 250 journalists that are currently in prison, um, we see the same proportions. Around three quarters of them are in prison on what's loosely called anti-state charges. The others are there on maybe on, on for either for no charge or on um, allegations of, of charges related to what we might consider to be traditional crimes of journalism, such as um, 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 criminal, li criminal libel, criminal defamation, for example, or, or incitement. But the anti-state charge is a thing that I think is really troubling. It's charges like sedition, like treason, and as me and my colleagues were facing in Egypt, um, charges like terrorism. It seems as though the state has been, or states around the world have been using the law, have been abandoning assassination and opting for um, persecution, opting for um, criminalization of journalists. That is a deeply troubling 
development and something that I think we, we need to think very hard about, particularly when it comes to understanding its impact on the way that our democracy works. There was one other number before we move on from the statistics, and that's the levels of impunity. And just to remind you, impunity is the number of journalist murders without prosecutions. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment and ask you to think about what a high number of unprosecuted cases, of unsolved cases, might look like. If you're thinking around 50%, 60%, maybe 70%, um, you'd be in the region of what most people suggest. They would say that's about as high as you could imagine it going. In fact, the number is 86%. Almost nine out of 10 killers of journalists um, remain free, which I think is a staggering number. And it tells you one of two things. Either the authorities don't care enough to seriously investigate the murders of journalists, or in some ways they are themselves complicit. That's one of the reasons why I am continuing to advocate for press freedom and justice for, for, for these cases, not just because of what it means for journalists, but because of the way, because of the trouble, deeply troubling, chilling effect that it has on the work that journalists do. So let's have a look at a couple of places around the world where we see journalism under attack. I want to start with one of the world's worst, uh, Turkey, which is, sits at 154 on the Reporters Sans Frontier World Press Freedom Index. This is out of 180, 154, it's 154th place out of 180. And that's largely because of the way in which, as in Egypt, Turkey has been weaponizing the war on terror, weaponizing national security legislation. Turkey's numbers, the numbers of journalists imprisoned in, in Turkey, surged suddenly in 2016 after an attempted coup. Um, and Turkey started rounding up hundreds of journalists um, and academics and human rights advocates, anybody, in fact, who was speaking out against or criticizing Re Recep Tayyip Erdogan. It was all in the name of national security, but you can see from the numbers involved, from the scope of the purge, um, from the scale of it, that it is not in fact related to national security. This is a, an example of the way in which an authoritarian government has used national security, has used that word terrorism um, in a way that is very difficult to define, but still used it to come after uncomfortable journalism. But it's not just authoritarian states which are problematic. The UK is at 35 in the World Press Freedom Index. Not bad, but certainly not brilliant. And in fact, the British government has recognised that it has a serious problem. We've seen recently a journalist, Lyra McKee, who was killed in, um, in Northern Ireland um, while covering protests, while covering rioters. And so, we see more killings, more assaults of journalists, more pressure on journalists. Let's have a look at the United States. Of course, President Trump has famously called journalism, the journalists, the uh, enemies of the people. The US sits at, in 45th place. Um, again, not spectacularly bad, but as the country that we all turn to for uh, as a bastion of, of, um, of civil liberties, um, as the home of the First Amendment, which guarantees the right to freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of religion, and freedom of the press. That is not an encouraging score. Um, and this number, by the way, was compiled before we saw the, uh, what the, um, um, the Black Lives Matter protests from earlier this year when hundreds, literally hundreds of journalists were targeted by both protesters and the police in covering the, the demonstrations and the police response to them. So I would be very surprised if in fact that number didn't slip, if the US, if the US didn't slip in its overall rankings. And this is important because, particularly because of the way that the US um, sets a standard for other countries to follow. When the US slips, it really opens up the opportunity, the possibility for other countries around the world 
to also further um, go after journalists in the, in the way that the US has, has led. And I think there, there's no one who seriously challenges the idea that President Trump has turned against the press in the, in, during the course of his, of his administration. What about Australia? Well, we're a little bit better than the US, we're better than the UK, but we're still not great. We sit at number 26. And there are a whole host of reasons for that, and we're going to go through some of them in more detail. Australia is been, has been spectacular in its um, use of, in fact, I'm going to back, back up to this particular slide. Australia has been spectacular in its passing of national security legislation. Currently, we have at least 82 separate pieces of national security legislation that, were part, that have been passed since 9-11. That is more than any other country on earth. Most of the legislation, much of the legislation is some of the most draconian on earth. We are fortunate that um, our legislation hasn't been used in the way that uh, other authoritarian states have used it. But my belief is that we are heading in the wrong direction and that we're really only out of the woods, large or, or not, we are not, not in a far worse situation because of the strength of our institutions and our political culture. Now, a few years ago, in fact, last year, early last year, uh, my organization, the Alliance for Journalist Freedom, published a white paper on press freedom. And in that white paper, we said that there were um, a whole host of pieces of national security legislation that had criminalized a lot of otherwise legitimate journalism that had undermined the capacity of journalists to protect their sources, that exposed sources to, um, to prosecution, and that was having an overall chilling effect on the work that journalists were doing. Two weeks later, we saw the AFP raids, uh, which seemed to legitimize everything that we had predicted, or verify, confirmed everything that we had predicted. Let's have a look at some of the laws, and I'll talk about the raids in a moment. Here's just a few examples. We've got Section 35P of the ASIO Act, which is a law that's designed to give ASIO agents the capacity to break the law um, in the pursuit of their, of, their, of, their, of their daily operation. So for example, if an, a, an, a, an ASIO agent needs to carry drugs in an undercover, um, uh, undercover operation to break open a drug smuggling, ring, um, he's able to do that without being prosecuted. The way 35P works is that it gives the minister the capacity th to throw a blanket of secrecy over any operation, any ASIO operation. The trouble is that it's so secret that even the declaration of an SIO, a special intelligence operation, is itself secret. And so journalists that are investigating the work of ASIO agents can quite unwittingly find themselves violating the act and facing up to five years in prison or 10 years if the act, if uh, publishing is considered to be aggravated. It's the other thing I think that's troubling about this is that the whole designation of, of, um, of a, an SIO exists in perpetuity. So there's no real review of this. Um, there is no judicial review. There's no opportunity to examine some of these, these um, the declarations. And what is troubling for journalists is that it can also be used to cover up a whole host of misconduct within ASIO. There's foreign fighter legislation which criminalizes um, promoting a promotion of, of terrorist ideology. Well, if you're a journalist, one of the things I think that you have a responsibility to do is to speak to all of those involved in a conflict and, and help us understand why, for example, foreign fighters um, or people might go off to, to fight with um, extremist groups. That is a very easy way of bringing you in contravention to the foreign fighter legislation, bringing you in breach of the foreign fight fighter legislation. We've got the data retention legislation, which is legislation that was passed a few years ago, um, designed to give us intelligence agencies the capacity to intercept terrorist communications. What this legislation does is give a whole host of government agencies the power to investigate the metadata, that is not the content of communications, but it's the information about the communications, and they're able to do that without a warrant. So for example, if you're sending, it, um, 
the agencies, and I'm not talking just about the federal police or ASIO, we're talking about um, border force, we're talking about even the post office, um, which is capable of looking into your metadata. And they can look at who you sent messages to, who you sent emails to, where you were when you sent them, the time that you sent them. You can look at the websites that you visit, a whole host of information that is in fact so powerful that it yields so much information by the time you cross-reference it that um, a former director of the CIA, in fact, once told a conference in the United States that the CIA actually issues kill orders on the strength of the information they can glean from metadata. This is of real concern to journalists because it makes it incredibly difficult to protect communications, confidential communications with, um, with confidential sources inside government. Um, and we know, in fact, that metadata has been used to investigate the sources of stories that have been embarrassing to the government. And, and in particular, I'm thinking of um, things such as the conditions on the offshore detention centers of Manus and Nauru. Metadata was used to investigate the, um, the um, medical workers that were leaking information about those, those camps to journalists. Now, I'd argue that whatever your, your thoughts are on the rights or wrongs, of that particular um, of that of, of those of that particular policy, that as Australians as voters we had a responsibility to know what was taking place in the offshore detention centres, what it was that our government was doing in our names, and so I think um, using metadata in that regard is a gross abuse of power and an attempt to silence legitimate journalism. So journalists have been taking all sorts of measures using encrypted communications to get around. Um, the risks of exposing their sources with metadata. But then the government passed the Telecommunications Assistance Act, which gives um, ASIO and other government agencies the power to compel telecommunications companies to help ASIO hack into even encrypted communications. There's Espionage and Foreign Interference Act, which um, makes it an offence to undermine confidence in, in um, Australia's trade and international relations. Well, of course, if you are doing critical reporting um, of Australian trade relations, or if you're reporting, oh, I don't know, how, um, how Australian agents might be hacking into or eavesdropping, might be bugging the offices of the Timorese negotiators in, during negotiations for oil rights in the East Timor Sea, then you can find yourself guilty uh, in contravention of this particular act. There are a whole host of pieces of legislation overall which criminalise what I would consider just a few of them. And what we saw with the AFP raids in June last year was those laws being applied. Now let me remind you a little bit about what happened back then. We had two raids. The first was on Annika Smethurst. Um, she was reporting on secret government plans to expand the powers of the ASD, which is the Australian Signals Directorate. The ASD, of course, is the agency that eavesdrops um, on, on, on our, our adversaries outside the country. It has no statutory power to use its incredibly sophisticated technology inside Australia's borders, except that the government was considering secretly um, changing the legislation to give it the powers to to snoop inside Australia. Now, again, as I mentioned a moment ago, whatever you consider the rights or wrongs of that policy, I'd argue that because it affects every Australian, we had a right to know about that change in policy. The other raid was on the ABC, the Afghan files story. Again, I'm sure most of you will be aware that the ABC was reporting on allegations of war crimes committed by Australian special forces in Afghanistan. Again, nothing was published that legitimately damaged national security, and that was, by any, way, any measure, I think, a story that was of genuine interest to every single Australian. The charges were dropped um, against um, Annika Smethurst initially, um, but, the AB, but the AFP continued its investigation into Sam Oaks. Now, I know that uh, just yesterday, um, yesterday or the day before, we saw um, the uh, Commonwealth Director of Prosecutions finally dropped the last of the charges against Sam Clark. And I'll talk about the, or Sam Oaks rather, 
Um, sorry, Dan Oakes, my apologies, that's a mistake. Um, Dan Oakes and Sam Clark. The, the point is that what I want you to pay attention to is the law that, um, that um, has been used here. The ABC journalists were charged with unlawfully obtaining military information under Section 73A of the Defence Act. Now that is understandable. We, it's, it's hard to see any courts giving or any legislators giving journalists exemptions from prosecution under this kind of legislation. But what we saw as a result of the raids was um, a lot of soul searching and we saw two parliamentary inquiries. We saw a lot of people talking about the need to reform Australian legislation to help protect press freedom. Have a look at one of the other, the other piece of legislation that was used to, um, that uh, Sam Oaks was charged against, charged with, and that's receiving stolen property under section 132.1 of the criminal code. This is particularly concerning because what it effectively does is define any information as stolen property. And that means that any journalist rece receiving information, receiving confidential documents, receiving documents uh, from a government source can be charged with receiving stolen property. Now, whatever national, whatever legislative reform we might be seeing through um, the parliamentary system, it's very hard to see anybody agreeing to change the criminal code to give journalists um, the right to receive stolen property if they deem it to be in the public interest. And this is one of the things that I think is particularly troubling about the way in which the law has been used here. We, we're seeing laws that were not intended to come after the journalists being creatively applied in ways that is having indisputably a chilling effect on journalism and public interest journalism. We saw the PJCIS, as I mentioned, inquiry, and they've passed, they recently handed down their recommendations. I'm going to spin through these quickly because I'm aware of, of time here. Um, one is to the inquiry, one of the, the, and I'm going to generalize, by the way, the uh, recommendations, there were 16 recommendations, and we can group them, or we can um, talk about them fairly broadly. There's no need for us to go in, into them in detail, but I think um, you'll understand the point once we get through them. One of the, the first, first areas to expand and strengthen the, the concept of the public interest advocate system. Now, if we go back to the data retention legislation, the government agreed to set up a system of public interest advocates to hear secret warrant applications for um, for uh, investigators wanting to in look into journalists. And I didn't mention this earlier, though. What, um, the, I did say that um, the uh, police are able to, to, or the investigators are able to look into any Australian's metadata without a warrant. The only exception to that is journalists. The problem is that the warrant hearings uh, take place in secret. Um, even the, the, there is no, in, in fact, uh, the advocates, the people involved in those, uh, those warrant applications are not allowed to approach the journalists. Um, and in, th there was a bit of a, of a hue and cry from journalists who, and media organisations who said that this system would still make it incredibly difficult for journalists and still expose journalists on their metadata and, and expose their sources. And so the government agreed to, or decided to introduce a system of public interest advocates to appear um, in the kind of adversarial role. The problem was that we had no way of knowing who the public interest advocates were. We had no way of knowing um, what role they would take. We had initially assumed that they would stand in the shoes of the journalists, but in fact, there's nothing in law that compels them to do that. And they could just as easily advocate for the public interest in, in going out and carrying out an investigation uh, for some reason. And so the system was really, in, in my view and the view of a lot of other of my colleagues, was really quite broken. And so the PJCIS has acknowledged the importance of the public interest advocate system, but believes it should be expanded and strengthened quite radically. It's nowhere near enough, in my view. Um, we still think that there should be um, legislative reform that allows for contested warrants, and, and in fact, contested warrants take place in the UK. But 
I think that um, the expanding and strengthening the public interest advocate system is a really important step forward and a key acknowledgement uh, that there needs to be an, a, a process of contestability. There needs to be um, some, some tension between the, or someone who's arguing against and in favour of the journalists uh, when it comes to warrant applications, even if they are taking place in secret. There needs to be increase in record keeping and reporting of key surveillance powers. Um, at the moment, we have no idea how many times the um, metadata, metadata is being used to surveil journalists. We don't know um, who, they, who they, they use it. What we do know is that uh, last year, the security, aid, sorry, the um, telecommunications companies received more than 300 thousand requests for access to metadata that's more than a thousand a day which itself i think is deeply deeply troubling most of those must surely not be for terrorist offenses um, we don't know exactly how many of them for, were for journalists we know that uh, it was a relatively small number but the reporting and record the record keeping reporting certainly seems to be incomplete there needs to be um, the public the uh, PTAC has recommended considering including a public interest offence for secrecy offences, um, which is the kind of thing that I think will have would have protected um, both um, um, Sam Oates and Dan Clark, uh, the ABC and, and Annika Smethers. They want they want to consider consulting mechanism for journalists and security agencies. In other words, if journalists come up with classified documents then ought to be a way in which the journalists can approach the security agencies to talk to them about the information safe in the knowledge that by approaching the security services they won't be prosecuted or investigated and that's a really important way of increasing the level of trust between these two organizations between these two institutions i'm not suggesting that journalists and security agencies collaborate, but there does need to be a mechanism that allows at least some form of communication so that we can make sure that genuinely sensitive documents are protected, but equally journalists are still able to carry out their investigations without fear of being, without fear of being prosecuted. There needs to be a review of the system for classifying government documents. It was broadly accepted that there is a chronic overclassification of documents, and as a fine example, um, even um, to give you an example of what overclassification looks like, um, ASIO made a submission. I remember we were looking at um, the submissions online of um, various government agencies and ASIO's submission to a public inquiry was classified, which I frankly thought was quite ridiculous. If ASIO couldn't provide an unclassified document that we could all look at and discuss and debate, then something was very wrong. Um, ASIO ended up, by the way, um, pulled it, withdrawing that document and, and uh, issuing an unclassified version. But I think part of the problem is that they instinctively and reflexively tend to classify documents um, far too broadly, which means that even if a document um, should be in the public domain, um, it can still be classified making a criminal offence for journalists to publish it. There was also a call to review and harmonise shield laws across jurisdictions, and of course, shield laws are those laws that allow journalists to protect their sources in court. The problem is that in most, almost every jurisdiction apart from Victoria, um, the shield laws only apply to court itself. Of course, that doesn't then stop the police from investigating journalist sources before the case ever gets to court. And that is a massive loophole in the system. Victoria has recognized that loophole and has moved to plug it. Um, the PJCIS believes that all jurisdictions should be doing the same. Um, there was also a call to review and improve the freedom of information system. And as anybody who has tried to access the system knows, it is impossibly slow and cumbersome and uh, really not working. And finally, um, no, sorry, that is the last of <laughs> the review of the freedom of information system. So the solution, well, there's been a lot of talk about legislative reform and cultural and political reform. But my organization, the Alliance for Journalists believe, Freedom believes there is one overall solution which we all ought to be considering and that's this one, a Media Freedom Act. As I mentioned earlier, 
the United States has um, the First Amendment, the, um, which protects press freedom. It is a remarkably powerful piece of, of law um, that has really shaped the influence or the power of freedom of, or protected freedom of speech and freedom of the press. The UK has a, a Bill of Rights. Canada also has something similar. In fact, all of the Five Eyes countries that, uh, we, that we are in partnership with have similar protection except Australia. We have no, nothing in our constitution that protects either freedom of speech or press freedom. Unfortunately, as anybody who has seen constitutional um, amendments or um, referenda uh, go in, a, in this country, um, it is almost impossible to change our constitution. And so we recognize that expecting a constitutional amendment protecting press freedom or introducing a Bill of Rights is a step too far, but we believe that a Media Freedom Act can do the job just as well. The Media Freedom Act will compel our legislators to take press freedom into account whenever they're passing legislation. Um, that doesn't mean that they have to give it priority all the time, but it must be taken into account when we are dealing with, um, when we're dealing with that legislation. They need to consider the impact of a certain piece of legislation on media freedom. And similarly, when the courts are adjudicating on cases that involve the media or when investigators are seeking warrants that involve the media, um, a Media Freedom Act would compel the courts and judges to take the impact of their decisions on media freedom into account. And a broad over overarching piece of legislation like that would filter down into all of the loopholes throughout our, our legal code in ways that would make it potentially um, stop, for example, the police using the Defence Act in the way that they did in the ABC, on the raid on the ABC, to um, using um, walking in with a, a search warrant um, accusing the, uh, the journalists of receiving stolen property. Ladies and gentlemen, I think this is crucial. I think this is absolutely vital because we need. A, a, a press that's free, that's capable of doing its job, not just for the sake of, of public information, that is important, but also because this is actually a part of, I think, part of national security. Because if national security is about anything at all, it is about protecting not just our physical health, um, it is about protecting the integrity of our system, of our democracy. And if a part of that, a key part of that system is a free media, which is helping to keep information flowing and helps to keep it accountable. So any legislation that undermines that central pillar, even if it is a national security piece of national security legislation, if, it, if in the process it actually undermines media freedom, then national security is in fact, in my view, also being undermined. I'd like to end with a couple of quotes. This is Maria Ressa, a remarkable woman who has, I think, been one of the the most extraordinary champions of press freedom um, and who's been under enormous pressure in the Philippines. Maria said, information is power. That's why we became journalists in the first place. And that's why we need to make sure that that power doesn't rest only in the hands of government. Finally, this is a great quote from media lawyer, Matt Collins, who said, the media doesn't have many friends in power because the role of the media is to hold the powerful to account. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm gonna leave it there. A couple of things I think that, need, that I wanna point out. First of all, we have had direct communications with the government and with the Attorney General, and we, we're seeking a meeting with the Attorney General at the moment. I'm hoping to talk to him about our, our program of legislative reform that, which, which, that we've proposed in our white paper and also in particular the Media Freedom Act. The government is particularly difficult in, um, in um, responding to, to this. They, they tend not to be particularly enthusiastic about it, but we are, we are able to get some attention. Um, we're also speaking to a number of very senior coalition politicians about this, but it's been very difficult to get movement from them.
it is it is easier to get meetings with the opposition with the Labour Party um, we've had a number of conversations with um, the Shadow Attorney General Mark Dreyfus um, with Christina Keneally the uh, Shadow Affairs Minister um, but I'd, I'd, I'd also reckon I, I think that um, I'd like to point out that that's probably because they have the luxury of knowing they don't have to actually act on their word at, not, at least not until they're elected and by that time an awful lot of things could have changed. The other thing though that I think is worth pointing out is that the PJCIS, the Parliamentary Joint Committee, Committee on Intelligence and Security, is indisputably the most powerful parliamentary committee that we have. And if you have a look at the overall flavour, if you like, of, of the recommendations in the report, what is abundantly clear is that the PJCIS and, and, and the, the recommendations of the report was unanimously adopted. So it, it, it was adopted by some very conservative um, uh, politicians who serve, sit on that committee. Um, overall, the flavour of the report is to recognise a crisis in media freedom in Australia. It recognises that there is a need for really profound legislative reform and really profound cultural reform throughout government. And so I think even though the government is under no obligation to enact the recommendations, I still think that the recommendations themselves, the report itself is a really encouraging sign that the government, or at least senior politicians, see and understand the extent of the problem and realize that something needs to be done. There are a lot of parallels. In fact, as someone who's got his feet firmly planted in both camps, um, it strikes me that academics and journalists um, are, are remarkably similar. Um, you know, obviously, we, we work in very different cultures. We work in very different, to very different timescales. And what, I guess, the, the standards that, that um, academics are required to meet are very different to the standards um, the journalists meet, and that obviously has a lot to do with the, the pressures and the expectations of, of each. But at the heart, we're both researchers. That word is really is really key, and so I think there is a lot of commonality. Journalists, of course, are intrinsically more likely to fall on the wrong side of the law or, or be pushing the boundaries of the law because of because by definition, a lot of what journalists are expected to do is to interrogate government and to look into those things that governments and politicians um, would probably want to keep hidden. But that doesn't mean that researchers um, are immune or exempt or are never, uh, never likely to, to come across, are never going to come across those kinds of problems. And so I think that what we're talking about is legitimate, uh, or there is a lot of shared interests in this, um, particularly when you've got when you've got researchers looking into you know, dealing with um, criminology researchers, for example, or researchers who are looking at um, in Australia's international relations. Um, it's easy to fall foul of, foreign, of um, espionage legislation, foreign interference legislation. Researchers, of course, who who are working with uh, foreign collaborators can find themselves coming up against some of these pieces of legislation. So I think that there is a really strong common interest. The fact that we are advocating for a change of legislation means that I don't have an easy answer to this, except that I think that there is, if, if there is a compelling public interest, if there is a compelling interest in the research that's being done, um, then I think we need, we need to see exemptions from prosecution. When I talk of an exemption from prosecution, by the way, I don't mean that it's impossible to prosecute a journalist or an academic. What I mean is that the burden of proof falls to the police or the investigators to show why um, a, a journalist or an investigator has broken the law. At the moment, the onus is on the other foot. The assumption is that, uh, is that or the burden of proof falls to the, um, the journalist or the, the, the researcher 
to show why there is a public interest in, in the investigation that they're doing. And so if we can invert that burden of proof, I think we'll be making great headway. I'm, I'm, the reason I'm pausing about this is I'm, I'm sort of a little bit uh, wary of, of that term democratic regression. I see and I agree that there are a lot of challenges to the way that democracies are working, a lot of backsliding, um, a lot of issues that I think are deeply troubling about the way that democracies have been working. And I think that at the heart of them, at the heart of the problem is that tension between national security and press freedom. Um, or, or more broadly between transparency and national security. What we are seeing in, in Australia more than most countries, most certainly most democracies, is an increasing closing down of, of access to information in government. Um, and I think that is deeply troubling. It's almost impossible now, that used to be the case that if you, that, um, you had a whole list of numbers, of phone numbers for departmental experts, of analysts, as a journalist, you could pick up the phone and call anyone in the department, and if they didn't know the answer, they'd refer you to a mate who was down the corridor and you could get information. Now that's almost impossible. You can't do that. You have to go through the media um, office of, of any given department, and they will take your question and they'll go and ask someone internally and they'll produce an answer and you never have the chance really to, to, to talk to or ask the people within the departments what's going on. What I was talking about earlier about the overclassification of documents is a part of that. The breakdown of the freedom of information system is a part of that. Um, and I think a lot of this is because of the war on terror, because of the way that the war on terror, initially at least, has allowed government or given governments the license to prioritize security and secrecy over all else in the name of keeping us safe. When in fact, what it does do is, is help close off a lot of areas of government from, from the visibility from, of, of, of voters. Um, and I think what we've seen happen in the, name, in the war on terror, we're seeing extended, less so in Australia, but certainly in, in parts of a, um, the Asia Pacific region, Latin America and so on, we're seeing governments now using COVID for the same ends, passing laws that criminalize um, the what, they, what they're describing as fake news in an attempt to um, control the flow of, or stop the flow of, of bad information around the coronavirus. Now, the problem, of course, is that in that situation, it's only the government that decides what news is, is fake. And, and in too, far too many cases, that means that anyone who reports, um, for example, caseloads that are at odds with the government's portrayal of, of the situation is now guilty of breaking the law. That's why I think a Media Freedom Act is really key to a lot of these problems. It won't solve all of the problems, but I think allowing journalists and enshrining the capacity of journalists to do their jobs in law is a really important step forward. It's an important development. Um, one of the things that we're often, um, we, we often pass laws in Australia in concert with, with our Five Eyes partners to make sure that, particularly when it comes to national security law legislation and information sharing legislation, laws that allow our security agencies, our intelligence agencies to swap data, to swap information. And they've, our politicians have been saying, well, that's fine because we're doing exactly the same thing as, as our colleagues, what's there to worry about? The problem is that those, that those, those uh, countries also have these really key pieces of human rights legislation that underpin, that lie underneath um, the information or intelligence sharing laws that effectively prevent those agencies from violating the privacy, for example, of journalists, viola from violating press freedom, um, press freedom laws. In Australia, because we don't have that, we are far more vulnerable than even our Five Eyes partners are. And so without this kind of legislation, without, without enshrining those principles in our legal code, um, 
we are, I think, far more vulnerable to an erosion of, of press freedom and erosion of democracy than a lot of our a, a lot of other countries are. Yeah, it's deeply concerning, isn't it? And um, you know, the the gap that you've exposed here, um, and the and the work that you're doing, I guess, is um, it's been yeah, incredibly revealing to all of us today, Peter. So I, I really appreciate um, sharing your your thoughts on on that, and also the importantly providing some really tangible solutions that our um, our government, our society can, can grasp and move forward with. So I'll, I'm going to finish by saying thank you. Thank you for being such an incredible um, QUT alumni and um, Brisbane um, citizen, um, and also for your incredible work that you're doing in your advocacy role and your UNESCO chair. So thank you very much.